Oh, the good Methodists just remain standing until they get told. This. You see, you know, it's your reminder of Lutheran calisthenics. Uh, we, the Lutherans on the second reading sat down even though Lynn had determined not to have you seated, so the Lutherans led you again in sitting and rising and sitting and rising. Well, your feet are going to work out tonight, and you know, we don't think much about them. Usually we're embarrassed by them. If you don't think you are, try to hold a foot washing ceremony. Let's see, it was three years ago we attempted that with this congregation, and I thought you were all storm out. It was hilarious to watch the discomfort level rise. Why are we so embarrassed by our feet? If you don't think you are, just slide your feet out of your shoes and leave them dangle there for... Put them back in your shoes. Uh, don't, don't leave them out very long. They're indispensable, right? Our feet. How are your feet doing this evening? Hardly aware of them, huh? Good shape, clean. Gary's got his shoes off. That's enough, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> Any foot washing necessary? Perhaps in the front row here. Maybe not till shower time or bath time, huh? But we're not going to do a foot washing tonight. We've already tried that. Foot washing was, was common in Jesus' day. We, we kind of put it on this night as if it's a big deal, but it was it's not really a big deal. It was kind of customary in uh, homes in Israel and Palestine in the first century. The roads there, of course, were dusty and dirty, dry weather. Like here, it would get pulverized into kind of a powder. It would be just a mess to walk around. We pave it all, so you don't know that, but if you walk out into the wilds, any, any hiking at all, you know how thick the dust gets, just this dirt all over the place. And then, of course, the rain comes, and it's this sticky mud, and so when you, when you go to a friend's house, they, they have a servant usually at the door. You kick off your sandals, which is kind of a poor excuse for protection of your feet, but it does cover the bottoms, but the tops, of course, get all muddy and dirty, and so your feet have to be washed. And, and typically in a well-to-do home, there would have been a servant at the door who would have washed the feet with a basin of water and wiped them off and dried them with a the towel. Now, in, in Jesus' little company of friends and his little circle of servants, there wasn't any servants in that group that stood out from all the others. The duties of the servants of a well-to-do house in a gathering like Jesus would have been passed around. Uh, it would have been shared kind of duties. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be the case this night. They don't seem to be sharing that duty. As some of you Bible scholars are aware, all the Gospels have a story of the Last Supper. Tonight, on Monday, Thursday, assigned in the lectionary that both of our churches tend to follow is John's Gospel, which is interesting because John's Gospel never really has the actual eating of a Last Supper and doesn't give us those iconic words that we get in the other synoptic Gospels of, this is my body given for you, this is the bread, my my body given for you, this is the cup of the new covenant. That's not found in, in John, at least not in any form that we would recognize. In Luke's rendering, we, we find out maybe why they weren't into foot washing that night. It seems on the way to the upper room, the disciples had an argument among themselves. Imagine a group of guys having an argument. I don't think it was about their brackets. I'm not exactly sure, but they, they, they said it was about which was the greatest. Not basketball team, but which was the greatest among them. Now imagine that kind of conversation. That's worse than a cheerleader squad in high school or a sports team in high school trying to decide who should make the all-star teams, you know, kind of arguing and posturing with each other about who's the best, who's the greatest among them. Probably ruffled more than a few feathers as they justified their case as to why they were the better, why they were the better choice. Probably left a little sore feelings among each other as they knocked each other down and lifted themselves up. And so I kind of imagine, at least in Luke's gospel, these group of disciples kind of trudging into the upper room like a group of sulking teenagers sore from conversation with each other that obviously hadn't gone well. Nobody seemed to pick up the pitcher in the basin that was at the door because it's when they're at table in John's gospel that Jesus does the deed that should have been done when they entered the room. Tonight, all of them sitting stubbornly, silently, sulkingly, didn't stoop for this menial task, weren't about to be servants of one another. So Jesus' action tonight is really kind of a thinly veiled correction to the behavior. No doubt the foot washing exercise was a visible parable of kingdom expectations. I think it's that for us tonight as well. It would be lovely to say that the church has learned its lesson 
uh, from those sulking disciples on that night. We know better, right? All you have to do is have a, a men's retreat and have a conversation about who's better, Luther or Wesley, which we did, and uh, we, we had it as a boxing match. And you, you know how in a church, it's easy to have people's feelings get hurt, isn't it? I mean, it's re remarkably easy to get feelings hurt for all kinds of reason. The root of much of it is we don't feel like we've been considered when somebody did something or somebody said something it's like they didn't consider us, or we feel like we're above it, you know? Certain actions, certain tasks, they, they should find someone less, you know, like you to do it. Maybe you, you felt like you, you didn't deserve something in church. You ever felt that? I didn't deserve that from my church family, some kind of treatment, or maybe lack of treatment that happens. If that's the case, I think Jesus is a good example for you, too. I mean, tonight, he throws a party for a bunch of backstabbers and deniers. Welcome to the church. And he humbly kneels and washes their feet and gives himself to them in a meal that tells them that in advance of all this skullduggery, they are forgiven of their failings and their shortcomings. That's how our Lord is with us. And that's what he says kingdom expectations are like. Here, here's, a, here's a lesson on gracious living from one who's self-possessed. Now, that's different than being self-absorbed. Self-absorbed is narcissistic. Self-possessed means I know the difference between you and me and the boundaries between us. And I'm me and you're you. And there's no, different, there's no, uh, no mixing and mingling of the two. But I'm a free agent and you're a free agent. And I can act on your behalf freely without being manipulated or manipulating you. A self-differentiated person. That's who Jesus seems to be in this very strange group of disciples who don't really have it all together. He says that we are and that we should be forgiven forgivers. Here's a lesson that there is only one kind of greatness. It's the greatness of servanthood. Now, the, the world and the church are full of people who are standing on their dignity, aren't they? When they really probably should be kneeling at the feet of brothers and sisters. In every sphere of life, no matter where we go, no matter what area of our life we go into, it seems that desire for prominence, unwillingness to take a subordinate place, wrecks the scheme of things and sets up a political system among people that oftentimes becomes disastrous. A player in a little league team doesn't make the first string or doesn't get on the first end of the batting list, and so they don't show up after that. An aspiring politician is passed over for some office to which he thought he had the right and refuses to take a subordinate office. You've seen it. A member of the choir, now I'm messing, right? Because the choir, the, the Methodists have a big choir. They're probably all here. Are you all the choir members here? I'm going to skip this one. No, a member of the choir. <laughs> Remember, the choir is not given a solo, you know? We tried, tried really hard for that solo, but we weren't given a, weren't given a solo, and so I'm not going to sing anymore. You've seen it, you know. I, I joked about high school earlier, but preschool is really where we often go, is I'm going to take my toys, and I'm going to go home. We do it in church just as much as we do it anywhere else in society. It happens in society as often as it does in the church, and, and that's really odd because we follow this guy who gives us such a stark contrast as an example. In any other society, any other parts of society, those unintentional slights can explode, can't they? You've seen them, Target, Vons, or into broods of sulkiness. You've seen those too. When we're tempted to think that our dignity or our prestige or our rights are what's important, we, we should pull out the picture that tonight presents for us, a picture of the Son of God wearing a towel on his knees at your feet, washing them. Let us contemplate the picture this night before we move to the great sacrifice of the cross, to the living example that Jesus gives us of our master who serves. 
And at Meyer, I told this story before, so the Lutherans might know it, but some of the Methodists maybe have never heard it before. Uh, an admirer of the late great uh, orchestra conductor Leonard Bernstein uh, asked, what's the most difficult instrument to play? You know the answer, right? Second fiddle, he said. I get first violinists, he say, all the time. Everybody wants to play first violin or first French horn or first flute. Nobody wants to play with the same enthusiasm second French horn or second flute. And that's the problem, he said. If nobody plays second, there will never be any harmony. That's a great example for the church. Not all the work that needs to be doing in the world is glorious and glamorous, isn't it? Those of you who are on altar guilds know exactly what I'm talking about this weekend, right? It's just not pretty. There's no glory in it. Not everyone, in fact, hardly anyone gets either all the glory that they deserve or all the blame that they deserve. And I say thank God for that. But there are plenty of us who do the majority of the work, who really get things done, who are usually the ones who are in the second chair are rarely the ones in the limelight, but they're the ones who get the jobs done. Those of you who work behind senior pastors know what I mean. I told Brian that I would give him one tonight. So. <laughs> or was I giving that to Gary? Yeah. You recall how the, the lesson ends tonight, the lesson that Gary read us about the foot washing. After Jesus finished, he says this, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done. Uh, recent studies, University of uh, Michigan released a recent study that talked about how uh, service is actually good for you. Maybe you heard that in the, the news recently. New research shows that doing any good may be good for your heart, your immune system, and your overall viability. According to the magazine that published a report from the University of Michigan's Research Center, they found that doing regular volunteer work more than any other activity dramatically increased life expectancy and probably vi vitality. Men, men, who do no volunteer work were two and a half times more likely to die during the study than men who volunteered at least once a week. And, and we're not in our stewardship drive at this point, so uh, that's good news. I'm not trying to manipulate something. Scientists also found that doing good may be good for your immune system as well as your nervous system. In giving ourselves away, the article said, we may be saving ourselves. Now, wait, wait a minute, wait, wait. I think I remember somebody somewhere, somebody saying something like that. Who was that? Those who give up their lives for the sake of the gospel will, will what, save it? And those who try to save their lives? They'll lose it. G.K. Chesterton, who's always exceedingly quotable, but you have to listen twice to the quote, said this, Christianity is the only religion on earth that has felt that omnipotence made God incomplete. Think about it. Christianity is the only religion on earth that has felt that omnipotence made God incomplete. Think about it. A conventional, all-powerful God might be what our egos desire, right? But this night, and the triad of events that we will celebrate together on this weekend, shatters the idol and presents to us instead a God whose power is manifest most greatly in humility. This God's omnipotence reaches an apex in utter self-emptying, a free acceptance of death as an act of service for others to change a brutal and terrible Friday into what we call Good Friday. He demonstrates it most vividly on Good Friday, but he lives it even more vividly for me on Monday Thursday when his disciples forsake him, abandon him, deny him, and squabble among themselves, and yet Jesus shows us the power of doing good, of service and compassion, even for the lot of those. This is our distinct calling in Christ, and this, for the sake of the world, you and I, brothers and sisters, must get right. Otherwise, our witness is hypocritical. The world does not care what, belie what beliefs we have. They're turning away from those beliefs but they do want to know that the gospel means something 
and shows itself for something. And the distinct calling of the Christian life is following our Savior in a life like his. Monday, Thursday, the first act of three, where we hear Jesus' words in our time of Holy Communion, this is my body, this is my blood, shed for you. Foot washing, giving ourselves away. Slaves work, right? Our work, our Christian calling is to serve and to love in his name. That's what the world is dying to see is what a difference we can make. As Jesus said at the end of the foot washing, if you know these things, you're blessed if you do them. Will you join me in prayer? God, we confess that we are reluctant servants. We like the cushy job, positions that have some power and prestige, do as much as anybody else. But help us, Lord, not to insist on them and to be willing to offer whatever service we might as you have served us, to offer whatever light you've poured into us for the sake of your world, the world that you have died to love. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.